Stephen, as always, good to see you. It's kind of a crazy day. First off, what is to stop? Like, for instance, what's to stop Mexico from looking at the Alamo and, you know, that whole, you know, all the way up to San Antonio and going, you know what? There's a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of Mexicans in Texas. I think we're going to have to declare it independent. And then if they need our help, we can roll in with the military because it's not invasion if you're annexing. See, it, that's such a lame thing to do. But that's exactly what is what Putin is just explaining here as his reason to go after this eastern portion of Ukraine. I wanted to get your response to this whole mess. Yeah, well, I still see this as primarily political and strategic theater. It's a it's a mind game and a pressure game. Uh, the objective is more control than actual occupation and accountability and responsibility. Uh, there have been a lot of parallels between Russia, Ukraine, and China, Taiwan. Some of them, I think, are a stretch. Some of them might actually apply. And like in this instance, the Beijing, without ever having governed Taiwan for a day under its current uh, government, it still claims it as part of its territory, has done so, uses it as a way to kind of pressure the population, et cetera. It doesn't guarantee that a military invasion is coming, uh, but it sure does sort of set the table for that threat. And we can never know. And so like we live with that contingency on Taiwan, Putin is definitely taking every available advantage at this moment, claiming things uh, on, in terms of uh, the, the uh, sovereign claim, uh, the economic influence and other kinds of claims. So I still see this as mostly theater. I don't know that it means guns are going to be a blazing just yet. They mm -hmm. could. It's just that he's getting everything out of this, including, as you say, free airtime all around the world. It's great PR. Yeah, it's it's so this whole thing has been really bizarre. We're talking with Stephen Yates, who uh, advised uh, former Vice President Cheney in the Bush uh, Cheney administration. And of course, you were you you're very familiar with 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 Putin, whose appearance has changed dramatically. You're uh, you're very familiar with Putin. You're very familiar with these tactics because they did this already with Crimea. They I mean, they annexed part of uh, part of Crimea and. Uh, this was under Obama Biden. There was no, 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 no sanctions, no real pushback. I agree with what you're saying, and that it seems very much like theater. Because you know, I was thinking about this uh, this eastern portion of Ukraine. The last thing that I would imagine that Putin would want is to have this, um, you know, Afghanistan style, you know, uh, fight in the streets of you know eastern Ukraine. Uh, and have all of these, you know, these different these different uh, conflicts, all these different fights with all these separatist groups, because he would have to justify that. We talked about this last week, I think, when he had that weird moment with Lavrov, and it was almost like he was trying to assuage the fears of Russians, who they're the ones who are feeding their families into this machine that's going to be spitting them out as bullets over here in this part of the world. So I think that would be harder for him to justify, which gives to me, it makes me really put a lot of stock in. Yeah, this is really theater. He's got 190, almost 200,000 troop build up on the border to use it as like a toddler tantrum. Like, I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing and I'm going to have this like devastating force, you know, at least at right here amassed so that you're too afraid to do anything and I can just get what I want. It's a it's a bold tactic, Cotton, but it looks like it's working for him because everybody else is too weak. Uh, very well, certainly true that everyone else is too weak. And he's sitting on a lot of petrol money uh, with that. And petrol is a fancy British word for gas. And, <laughs> oil. Uh, and so they have a lot of money. And all this does is jack those prices up more. So he's got money to throw around for his military to have a, a nice vacation in snowy areas to reposition and whatever. He So they, they're not exactly hurting in that regard. Very, we have to be honest, he could very well take a piece of the Ukraine. It would be one of those, quote unquote, minor incursions, though, probably not an attack on the capital city, not a take over the whole country, Ukraine. Maybe they want that, but that would come with it would come with a lot of really honorary people to try to have to govern over. Uh, and so there isn't sort of a crown jewel of resources that say why they must do it. There isn't access to a magical seaport that would justify it. They got that with the Crimea. So it's, there's, he's just getting a lot of bang for his buck. He could go further. This still is a Europe first problem. Yes. And uh, no matter what uh, President Biden's 
sins may be, and there are many. I mean, all this talk about, well, we're going to sanction you if you do this, and they go, okay, uh, and uh, or or we're, we're going to send our vice president to a think tank event in Germany, and we're going to rally Germany, and everyone's unified, and they go, okay. Uh, you've got the poor, desperate leadership of the Ukraine out there saying, come on, we feel abandoned. Well, because you have been, uh, it's just, you know, it's it's a sad situation, but I just don't see how much more Putin right. can get. And he has to be careful. At some point, he could awaken Europe from this postmodern slumber. Uh, he could get them to finally do what they have refused to do, which is pay enough for their own defense well, and take care of their own problems. I remember, so remember when Trump was, point. I don't know when he gets there. Remember when Trump was the bad guy because he was trying to get Angela Merkel to spend just a little bit yeah. more, you know, maybe just get up to 2%. You're at like 1.7 of your GDP towards your defense, talking with our friend Stephen Yates. This might be kind of a weird question, but one of the things that he's that he wanted that was a non-starter obviously for everybody else was you cannot allow Ukraine to enter NATO but yet there have been a number of former Soviet countries that have become NATO members is this big due to the whole nuclear armament breakdown after the Soviet Union was felled and they were all everybody was you know it was was they were all dismembered and uh, because Ukraine from what I understand had like one of the had like the third biggest, uh, nuclear arsenal in the world after that and they ended up getting it was a weird custody agreement like Russia got control Ukraine got possession it, it, is that one of the reasons why do you, is that a motivation for them well I think the the whole discussion of NATO at this point is in a very very odd context because what exactly is NATO accomplishing? What is its purpose? What are people paying for and what are they getting? And I think that's a really tough conversation to have right now, one that a lot of Europeans are not sobered up sufficiently for. Uh, they could say, well, we want American leadership. We need, okay, good for you that you want American leadership, but this is your yard, your economies are 20 times that of Russia. You've got to carry your own freight and you've got to have your own rationale for this alliance. Ukraine is not a NATO member. At this point, I don't even know that they want to be right. a member of an ineffectual alliance. Yeah. And we can't necessarily have them in right now. We would be at an automatic state of war with Russia. The United States would be under treaty if we admitted them under current circumstances right. because they have a disputed territory with Russia right now. And so it just doesn't even make practical sense to have that be a part of the discussion. I, I agree with you talking with Stephen Yates that it's a Europe first problem. This is Europe's thing. And and I know that you, that, that the United Kingdom, I saw a headline from Bojo this morning saying, oh, Europe hasn't been on the brink like this since 1945. Wink, wink, nudge, nudge, U.S. It's like, deal with it. Why? I mean, everybody complains about the United States getting involved in, in, in things. And then when something pops off. Who is the who is the country that they all run to? The United States. Can you guys? I mean, you're basically NATO. You basically fund and and staff NATO. Why don't you guys come get involved some more? Why don't you guys come? As, wait, this is Europe's issue. What what the hell's Europe? What they what they've been doing this whole time? They know they know what the risks are. Part of the Afghanistan experience too. Uh, under in Afghanistan, the NATO forces were under an acronym called ISAF ISAF. And I, I heard Pete Hexeth joking over the weekend. He says it. They they said it referred to I saw Americans fighting. Uh, <laughs> and that, in some ways, oh. that is a painful analogy for what the realities of the alliance has been. That has to change. Yeah. No. True. I completely. I completely agree with that. Uh, this um, Kamala Harris was over. I don't know what she was doing. They were in Munich, which I think was very. The fact that they're all in Munich and they were all talking about essentially the Finlandization of of Ukraine. There was a great piece about that, I think, in either Wall Street Journal or somewhere talking about what happened with Finland after World War Two. And they gave up a slice of land to Russia and and then they were able to be economically independent for a period. But they still had to basically show fealty to Russia. And that and that's ultimately what Biden's proposal, it sounds like when you when you mentioned that minor incursion phrase kind of seems like that's what he was suggesting with this. They sent Kamala Harris over there. Stephen, I haven't heard anything from this woman, vice president of the United States. I can't imagine a worse con worse person to send over as a diplomat for this particular issue. No, I don't know what she accomplished in Munich except to further Biden's Chamberlain esque behavior. Have you, did you, do you, are you aware of anything that she's done? Has she? 
<laughs> it was, it was all talking points. We've we've been a, we've been around this, and I still still think it's true. This is all calm strategy. Yeah. And even at that, there are a couple of quotes from her that I can't even tell. I need an English to English <laughs> translator to help me understand what she was actually trying to say. But it sort of begins with unity, and they're going to be scared, and there's going to be a war, and there's not going to be a war, and diplomacy has a chance, but there's going to be a war, and I can't make heads or tails of it. And yeah. so to me, it was, a, it was a mistake. Now, I don't support anybody going to these silly gatherings. It's not, it's not the room where it happens, as the Hamilton right. show would say. Uh, this is the room where establishment people get together and bask in the warm bath of conventional thinking. And that's not how we get out of a problem like this. It's how we got into a problem like this. That I love that point that you just made. Make sure we grab that because I want to share that online. That was a great point. Uh, Stephen, last quick question for you. Macron was reported to be scrambling over the weekend to get Biden and Putin to talk. Why didn't Biden just say, you call Putin, you deal with it? Yeah, well, there's a whole bunch of questions that hurt my head with all of them. <laughs> I mean... Why, if this is something that potentially risks American troops being involved, which I don't think should happen, why isn't it worth the president's time to go to Europe and talk to people? Why isn't it worth the president's time to meet and talk to Putin? I mean, if it's really this stark of the stakes in the world, why can't you climb out of your basement and go talk to a real leader and negotiate Or send peace? a diplomat to Kiev, at least. An actual ambassador. Something. Something. If only there was someone who could go and stand shoulder to shoulder with the people we say we're trying to defend. <laughs> I don't even know what I think about. I think sometimes I wonder it was Chamberlain worse or because it's, it's President's, you know, President's Day observing it. And I'm just thinking, which who was the worst? Who really was the worst? I always maintain that I think it was FDR and maybe Hoover. I, I, I really dislike them both. And I don't know. This Those one's still got a shot. Yeah, they still. <laughs> Still have a shot. There you go. Stephen Yates, always appreciate it. Make sure you go and find him on Twitter. We have his handles up. Uh, Stephen, always appreciate it, as I said. Thank you so much. Have a great week. And uh, who knows what we'll be talking about later on. God bless you. Thank you, Dana. Take care. Take care.